John Mayer. I'm, uh, I'm from the States. I, I live in New York City. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about a library that I wrote um, called Liquid Thorium, which implements parallel CFRP with web workers. CFRP is uh, concurrent functional reactive programming, which is sort of the flavor of FRP that Evan worked on in his uh, PLDI paper and also his thesis previously. And um, so there's, there's this question of, well, it's already concurrent. Why do we need parallelism, right? <clears throat> and so I guess there's every parallelism talk starts with the same, what's the difference between parallelism and concurrency? And I always like to think of it, it's, it's kind of simple. Concurrency is you like to do lots of different things at different times. You don't know when certain events are going to come in. You don't know when you're going to have to run certain parts of your code. So concurrency helps you manage all of that weirdness of like what GUIs have or what servers have. Th that's concurrency. Parallelism is just doing multiple things at the same time. And you only really care about parallelism when you want performance. So why do we want to do things in parallel? Well, for performance. And so web workers are these things in JavaScript that let you run stuff on an actual thread. So we have multi-threaded stuff in the browser. And I haven't seen a ton of things that use web workers, to be honest, in the browser. I don't know. It's, maybe it's because they're new, or maybe because the model isn't very good or close to what people expect with threads. But I found them actually quite useful for what I'm going to try to do. And, uh, and so we'll, we'll take a look and see how it went. And um, so first I want to talk about um, the current Elm runtime. And I call it the DFT because it's a depth-first traversal of the signal graph. And so I, I wrote up here a specification of a program. And I'm going to take probably a, a long time explaining how, um, how this would be laid out in the signal graph and how actually a couple of simple executions would work. Um, so this is called the key mouse saver example. And because we're going to be saving the keyboard and the mouse, and we're going to be displaying it for you. And it'll be this really revolutionary tool um, for, for all of us. Um, so we're going to take the current mouse position. And to do that, we're going to build an input. We'll call this m dot position. And so whenever you build an input, um, you have to give it an initial value. Um, when we do this in code, we don't do this. But it is seeded with an initial value at runtime. And so for us, we're going to say that this is uh, the tuple, and this is 0, 0. And um, for each coordinate, what we want to do is we want to calculate the Fibonacci number of this. Uh, so if, if these are the coordinates of the indexes, we want the ith Fibonacci number. So what we're going to do is we're going to create we're going to lift first. We're going to lift second. And then we're going to lift fib. And I'm not going to implement fib, because we kind of know how it goes. But, um, <laughs> but what's going to be interesting is that we're going to use, uh, you know, well, Maybe this is something that's really expensive. So we did the naive Fibonacci number. So this is something. We, we actually aren't smart enough to write the good fib. But maybe, uh, spoiler alert, we're going to want them both run at the same time. And so uh, we're going to take a look. We're going to use our signals. That's how these are connected to the signal graph. So the next thing we're going to take is the last key that we pressed. A dot last. And for sake of, I guess, this, we're going to say that, that was just the letter A. That's what we start with, and that's the default, the last key that we pressed. And so we're going to lift all three of them into a tuple. And so we have a function. Yeah, we're going to sort of say, OK, we're going to, this takes three arguments, right? And so uh, I'll put this off to the side. We know that this is a arrow b, arrow c, arrow tuple a, b, c, right? Everyone familiar with that kind of notation? And so because that takes three arguments, we're going to lift three. And 
Now I'm going to put some extra space here. We'll see why that's necessary. So we're going to lift put the x coordinate that's lifted, the y coordinate that's lifted, the key press is lifted. And so now we've built this up, and so we know that the initial value is going to be, well, 0, we take the 0, the first 0th Fibonacci number is 1, the 0th Fibonacci number is 1, and A. So we built the signal graph, and so uh, remember, mo all signals have an initial value. So the initial value here is, is we just propagate straight through. And then the last thing we're going to do is we're going to take mouse clicks. Uh, which is a unit. We're going to sample, and I'm going to get kind of low here now. And so we're going to take this value here, and we're going to sample on the mouse clicks. And so the initial value on sample on is the same thing. It's this tuple of uh, 1, 1, and then finally, and, and this is going to be a little hand wavy, but imagine we have a, a function that sort of did, you know, took the, the first and second and third parts of this tuple. And we're going to compose that with as text. And we're going to send that to our browser which looks a little like this and has some buttons and it has some scroll, right? And so now we're gonna, we're gonna kind of do this. And so what gets displayed on the screen is this, just one, one, A, right? Everyone follow me so far? Any questions? Okay, great. So, um, I, I mean seriously, fair questions. I didn't mean to, but you know, uh, uh, if, if we program with album, this should be pretty straightforward. Um, so let's see what happens when we move the mouse, right? If we move the mouse, so we're going to say uh, mouse to six, no, that's too big, five, six. So the, the, what happens in Elm, and the current Elm implementation is single threaded, and we're going to do a depth first reversal of this graph to eventually figure out what we're gonna have on the bottom. And so the first thing we do is we actually get a change event to the mouse input here. This is gonna be five, six. And so we're gonna start with the left and we're gonna say, okay, we're gonna send a five, six down here. This gets lifted, so this is gonna be a five. And then uh, one, two, three, five, eight, zero, one, two, three, four, five. We're going to send an 8 down here. And we're not going to update lift yet. We're going to wait until everything gets there. And so on the right side, we have, we're going to send a 5, 6 to this. 6 will come out. We've got a 13 here. And we're still not ready to update our lift 3 yet because we haven't gotten all the inputs. And so now, whenever we get an event from the outside, we have to send a change event originating from all of our inputs. So we're going to send just a no change. I'm going to make a little dot and say, oh, this event didn't change. It's still just A. And so when the no change event gets down here to the lift 3, we can say, ah, we've gotten all of the input values. Now we can update this. And so we can say, OK, 8, 13. And the A is unchanged. Uh, and now at this point, we can say, OK, we'll send down here 8, 13, A. Because as long as at least one of the inputs to this lifted function changes, its output will, be, will change. And um, now sample on, how does sample on work? Well, sample on, uh, every time its sampler updates, its uh, output updates, but if it's, um, I guess, the data input signal, whenever that changes, it kind of has to update its cache of the last value. So we see that m.clicks is going to be a no change, only the mouse moved. So this is our no change that comes down here, which means that the output of sample on itself is going to be no change. And this will be no change. And our screen will still show a 1, 1a. 
However, we're going to update this to, to show our new values of 8, 13. And so this is what we would expect, right? We wrote our program so that our, you know, everything goes through this sample on. We're only going to recompute our display when we have a mouse click. So moving our mouse around shouldn't change anything, only some internal representation that we don't really see. So this is as we suspect. I'll switch colors here. Um, and I'll erase some of these change messages to give me some room. So the next thing we're going to do is, well, what happens with the keyboard press? And I'll go through this a little quicker because it's, it's more or less the same. And there are a lot more no change events that we have to worry about. A lot fewer change events. And so let's say we press to C. Uh, and these are going to be no changes. And so we'll just go through all the way again. Well, so down the graph this way. Okay, we have to stop, we'll walk up the graph, depth traversal again, we'll get to here, walk up the graph, okay, now to the next input, okay, we have a C, okay, so now we can update this, so that's a C, okay, now we go to mouse clicks, all right, well, uh, this is not a change, so we can update this to the C, but then this is a no change, and this is a no change. And so again, we, two, two different inputs are going to be changing the internal structure. And finally, uh, we would say, OK, well, now we do a mouse click. We're going to click our mouse. Did my screen go? Yeah. Thanks. Oh. Well, now everyone will see your name. That's my name. Um, <laughs> So for mouse clicks, we're going to say no change, 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 unit, right? And so even though the value itself hasn't changed, it's like a fresh version. It's an updated. So that's why we were actually talking on the list. Maybe they shouldn't be called change events. Maybe they should be called updated events or fresh events or something like that. Um, and so since we know that this is unit, we can say, oh, the output of sample on is now the value, the last value that we have cached in here. And so this will get passed into our formatter, and our screen will update 813C. And so this is the basic algorithm that's in Elm right now. So we have this single threaded model where we do all of the inputs at once. This whole thing runs as one big uh, depth traverse traversal algorithm. The final stuff at the bottom either changes or doesn't change, and then we draw from that or don't update our screen if nothing's changed. And so this is kind of this is kind of convenient because that's really easy for us to write. Um, but and let's let me sync up here with our, our projector really quick. I'm not really sure how. Sorry? Oh, yeah. Searching, huh? HDMI now. There we go. I think this cord is finicky, so watch out for that. OK, so, so this is great, but so what do we not get? Well, we don't get pipeline parallelism um, for two reasons. First of all, because we're, we're single-threaded, so we can't do that. But also, you notice that if I really quickly moved the mouse and then did a key press, and then I clicked, right? I mean, it's good that the click waits until all the other things go through, and then clicks come down, and we update the display when we're supposed to. However, the mouse click kind of cues up here and can't start until all the change messages from previous inputs uh, are fully resolved, you could say. The round has ended. So one input comes in, we update the entire graph, and then we say, OK, well, what's the next input? So we don't get, we don't get pipeline parallelism. Um, we all don't, also don't get sort of like independent execution. So remember I said Fibonacci is this 
is this really expensive algorithm because we don't know what we're doing. Or maybe we're in the real world and there is some really expensive thing that we're doing, like some crypto stuff. I don't know, right? So, um, so, right, so we can't run both of these Fibonaccis at once. We can only run this one and finish it, and then we run this one, and then it gets down. And so we don't get independent execution either, which is kind of unfortunate. So CFRP is supposed to be parallel, or really can be parallel with not a lot of work. And there's two ways we can do it. Um, we can do actors, like in Erlang and Scala. And so how would we think of how we could do this in actors? Well, let's say each one of these nodes is an actor, and it can send messages to the mailbox of like where the arrow is pointing. So mouse.position, whenever I got a new input, would know to send a mail to this guy and to this guy. And then these guys would have their own sort of loops. And they would say, oh, read my mailbox, read my mailbox. Oh, I got a mail. Do what I'm supposed to do is my node to send a mail down the next arrow. Um, and so if you're not familiar with actors, it's like everyone has a mailbox, and they run their own code in a loop, and they just read from the mailbox and, and do what they're supposed to do. They can send mail to other people. Uh, it's very message passaging kind of thing. And so the other one is communicating sequential processes, which is what Go and Haskell can do. And so in this uh, idea, we have threads and uh, channels or, or boxes. And so a thread will go along and say, OK, I'm at the point where I need to send a message. I, I'm sending a message here down a channel. And so the other person says they do that code. And there's like, oh, I need to read from the channel. And so you get like a rendezvous between these two people. You pass the message synchronously. Um, and you can also do buffered versions if you'd like. Um, so instead of having to write, oh, I want to send a mail to this address, you just, oh, I'm going to put it down this channel. And so it's the same thing. So each one of these would be a thread. Um, and you would pass uh, your message down the channel. So the channels would be arrows. So this is possible to do in, in all of these languages. So the question is, well, what, what the heck? You know, like, why don't we have this? And of course, it's because JavaScript has none of this, right? JavaScript doesn't have actors. JavaScript doesn't have coroutines or lightweight threads or any of these really cool things that all of our modern languages have. Um, and it's really because all of these languages have multiplexing. Um, multiplexing is this idea that we have lots of tasks, and we have a couple of finite engines that can run tasks. And so we have this uh, scheduler, which will multiplex, or will schedule all the tasks on the engines. It will, it will do this work for us. And JavaScript doesn't have that. JavaScript is, has just this big event loop. Oh, I get an event, do, do, do what I say until I'm done, and then wait for the next event, right? And so we see multiplexing in operating systems. Operating systems will take your OS threads and run them on your CPUs. Uh, databases will take your queries and your inserts and updates and, and run them on like virtual engines so they don't have too many things running at once. And then all of these languages from the last slide, they will multiplex their lightweight threads or their green threads or their actors onto operating system threads. They'll have their own sort of user land level um, kernel and scheduler. And um, so this is what I did. And I decided. Um, in version two of Liquid Thorium, which I wrote sort of in the past week, um, that the tasks were gonna be function application and the engines are gonna be the web workers, right? So we have our web workers and then occasionally when we get through this signal graph, this execution, oh, we need to apply Fibonacci to something or we need to apply first to a tuple or we need to you know, do any of these things or we need to you know, say all of this, right? This is a big function that gets applied to its input. And so the, I wrote a scheduler that is going to manage all this. Oh, I have some work to do. Let's go throw that work on a web worker and, and see what happens. And so the first time this happens is lift. Well, lift is a node that has a function. It gets some, some, some signal values. And uh, if they change, well, then I apply the function. And then I send it down. Uh, fold p is similar. I have this function. And I have a state that I'm going to keep with me. I'm not going to share with anyone. And I get values down. I apply the, the, the value I got and my state into the function. I save that state for later. And I send that state down to the next person. And then the last one is app, which is actually the same thing as all of our lift twos. But you th I like to think of it as this way. You, your one signal, you get a function. And the other signal, you get a value. You apply them together, and you send it down. 
And so maybe if I, I get a new function but not a new value, I'll apply the new function to the old argument. Or if I get a new argument but not a new function, I'll apply the old function to the new argument. But it's this idea of signals of functions are coming down this side and signals of arguments are coming down and I apply them together and send them down. And so that's uh, uh, kind of what I can do. And so we can actually write like a lift three as a lift and a couple of apps. And if you've seen uh, the uh, syntax in Elm where we have like the little squiggly, where we use the tilde and the tilde squiggly arrow, that's actually lift an app. But we've seen it's the same as like a lift three or a lift four or a lift five. Um, and so actually one of the challenges when, was when I was writing app was like, oh, well, I have a signal of functions, but functions are, are functions in JavaScript. How, do, how can I give functions to web workers? And so I actually wind up writing a little bit of thunks. Uh, and a thunk is a pair of a function name or a function pointer um, and its environment, all of its free variables. So we know exactly uh, what's allowed. So if we want to do like an, a partially applied function, uh, we apply the first two variables. We can think of a thunk of being the function and the first variable and the second variable. And we store that as a thunk until we get our third variable and we throw it all together and do what we need to do. Um, so what's involved here? So we have a couple of different data structures that are important to actually make all of this work. The first one is the task wait queue. And so that basically says, well, whenever we have a change message come in, oh, well, we need to apply this function. Oh, we need to apply this function, this function. And if our, if our engines are busy, we'll put things on the task wait queue. Similarly, if we've run out of things to do, the engines can say, oh, well, I'm ready. You can give me work later. And so usually only one of these will be non-zero, right, depending on what's going on in your system. Um, but and th these are pretty standard stuff that we would have in a scheduler. So these are the things I can do but can't do right now. And the engines are, oh, I'm ready, but there's no work for me to do right now. So these are two things that are kind of important. Um, each node has a mailbox queue. So we can say, oh, well, we had this event, and then another event, and then another event. And they sort of queue up um, so we don't drop any messages. Um, and then finally, there's this thing called the active worker dashboard, which I kind of threw it in the end for sort of debugging purposes. But it actually looks really cool to see, oh, where some nodes are running on web workers. So that, that's kind of cool. So I'm going to show you how this works and uh, the one demo I have. Um, and now this actually is going to be really small. And so the program is draw a circle where the mouse is, and also every second uh, calculate a new Fibonacci number. And so you can see that as the number um, gets bigger, and I, I don't calculate Fibonacci at any larger than 40, but you can see it actually takes a long time to actually do this calculation. And so 691B53B is the node that is doing the Fibonacci calculation. I, 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 you know, I, I don't, it's different every time I generate a new one, but I know it's the one doing a lot of work, so that's the one on there. And it's neat because, uh, you know, it's in parallel, so we don't actually uh, affect things because we can be running lots of things. And you see as I move around, um, all these tiny little other function applications are happening on other web workers. There are, there are four web workers in this example. And so nothing runs into each other, nothing blocks. And so I'm going to quickly show you how this looks. And we'll look at the source code and see what got built up here. So I don't, I don't do any code generation from Haskell. This is just the JavaScript. But so we'll have mouse, clock, um, let's see. We will like fold over a, a counter. So like plus and zero, maybe. Um, then we'll take the Fibonacci of that counter value. And then we're going to apply the two of these. Um, going to just concat the values here. Um, and then from here, we're going to draw the circle. And then also 
prints the fib. And what's kind of neat here is you could see that um, for those of you who have read the paper, there's uh, this thing called async. Um, and so that actually means that this Fibonacci uh, goes out into the, uh, uh, the global event dispatcher and then comes back. So we can update the mouse and send these change messages through even while we're waiting for the fib. So th this isn't actually going to block the rest of the execution. If I take that off, we see some interesting behavior where once the Fibonacci takes a really long time, uh, and so I'll let this get up to like 35, 36, uh, we'll see that we start queuing up a whole bunch of messages. And so I'll, I'll do this a bunch of times. And so you can see the circle is way behind the mouse now because we're waiting for all these Fibonaccis to um, sort of finish. And so this is not desirable. Uh, you know, uh, behavior. Um, so, uh, so by adding the async, we actually say, oh, when you're drawing the mouse, or rather when you're combining the mouse updates and the Fibonacci updates, don't necessarily wait for all the Fibonaccis. Just, just go ahead and, and, and ignore that. It will come back later. It takes a long time, and we, we accept that. Um, so that, that was kind of cool. So let me get back to the presentation uh, and wrap up. So if you're writing code like this, you have some nice properties. Uh, the, the library um, gives you two things, a graph builder, which says, give me an input node, give me a lift, an app, a fold piece, so, and, and it, it's sort of like a graph builder. And at the end, you say, okay, give me the graph. And so the signal graph is now just an object, which we don't necessarily have to use this to build. We can just generate this as a big JSON object. So that's kind of cool. And then also the scheduler that I talked about. Uh, the reactor code is just a small amount of code that runs on the web worker and basically says, uh, oh, which function should I run? Which arguments should I run? Okay, do the function application and then return it to the scheduler. Really basic. Um, and so what's kind of funny is that uh, the user code, the pure user code is separate from the setup code. So the user code says, well, these are all of my pure functions that I have to run. And they all take one argument, and they might return a thunk, and some of them will return their values. And that is actually going to get loaded by the web workers as sort of a library. The web workers will import your pure code, because that's all the function application. And then below, the setup code is really just instructions to build the graph and, like, start. That's it. And so that was really cool. And I, I, I found it nice that it, it, you couldn't do this any other way. You would have to separate your pure code and your sort of signal setup code. And, and so that was a, a neat result that fell out, I guess. And, um, and yeah, and so this lets us write async. You can't really write async without um, some improvement to uh, at least the way the scheduler works. Uh, so this was really fun. I added this in the last couple of days on Evan's suggestion. And I'm like, yeah, this is really cool. We can finally put this together. And, uh, and so that was it. So that, that's what I have to say about uh, Liquid Thorium. Uh, I guess the roadmap is keep, you know, write it from scratch a couple more times, keep improving it. I know there's a lot of ways I can fix bugs, and, and it's, uh, you know, it's in a good spot right now, but it can always be better. And then hopefully maybe have it influence, um, you know, the way the Elm scheduler works. or potentially just be an alternate back end for, for the JavaScript. So I'm really excited about both of those. But does have any, have any questions about uh, what's going on? You said that your code, each web worker loads the same copy of your code. Yeah. And then the main thread uses strings. It passes strings to the web worker to tell what to set up. Right. So, so those are, that would be an interesting piece of code to look at, actually, because um, they're both fairly small. Um, uh, pure. I don't think it's a little smaller. So the reactor basically says over here, um, every time I get a message, go get that function, apply it, and then return it back to the scheduler. And so then the pure code looks like this. It's just, you know, the get x, get y for record access. Stringify, concat actually returns a thunk because it, it takes two arguments. 
um, combining, combine also does a thunk, counter, Fibonacci. Um, and so you see the way I access it, I do import scripts. So the reactor, the web worker, has this function called import scripts. It, you give it a file, and it basically takes something in and, and evals the whole thing and, uh, and all it does. And I also do the same thing with underscore, because it's kind of convenient. Though I, I don't think I still need that. So uh, do you have a, your program has a list of global functions? Uh -huh. Right, and so when I say uh, I want to make a a lift, um, uh, so I don't have any regular lifts anymore. But so ba I'm basically saying um, lift the combined function whose first argument is named mouse onto the m signal, right? And so when the scheduler runs, it says, "Oh, well, this is a lift. It's going to be a combine. Um, I have my input." So add that as mouse to the environment, and then send combine and the environment to the web worker. And the web worker just does the application and sends it back. So yeah, everything is, is by name. But hopefully this would be generated code, yeah. right? So then you wouldn't have to worry about like, the error of not getting your string right. Um, and so you, you would make sure that all of your function names were unique and, and whatnot. Um, but yeah, so like this code would hopefully be generated and pure also could be generated. But the fact that they're separate, I just, I just thought was a neat kind of result. But yeah, I just do do it by, uh, you know, like a global index by the name. Okay, that's the function name, uh, and just go run that. So. So part, part of the, the reason for structuring this way is that with web workers, you can't send functions across mm -hmm. uh, between different threads. Um, just for background. Yeah, yeah. So web workers can send objects and array buffers. But functions themselves aren't the serializable thing. So just at some point you'd have to yeah. capture the context of that function and then you can move it across and perhaps then you can have race conditions in JavaScript because you modified something in a thread and that change actually changes something in another thread. Mm -hmm. All the workers know how to do every kind of function application. All of the functions are available to it. And so you just tell it <clears throat> which, run to, which one to run, and here are the arguments that you should run it with, and, and you know, give me back the result. Yeah. And so yeah, and, and it's, it's a shame that JavaScript can't serialize functions, because that would be kind of nice. But yeah, it, it is exactly that problem, is that it would have to build up all the closures and, and do all this. So it is kind of just more convenient to say, well, here are all the functions that I could possibly run, and, and I'll just I'll tell you, pick this one, do this one, do that one. Great, but maybe I'm, I'm ignorant of something, but um, actually, I don't know anything about web workers. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> could you? Um, sure, the, the basic API of a web worker is. It, what, 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 I want to know what it's, uh, what it's, uh, it, it, it is actually, and um, how do you use it? Yeah. So, so a web worker is a thread, in, a heavyweight thread, an operating system so, thread. Yeah, so early on in mm -hmm. the thesis process, I was like, oh, crap, it's all sequential. I need some sort of no web worker. So this, there's this new spec. Yeah, um, and it, it's really expensive to spin up a new web worker. So that's why I allocate, you know, for me, I'll say, like, oh, and run this on four web workers. That's how I start the function. And so I, the API for interacting with the web worker is you send it a message and web workers can send you back messages. So the messages that I send are, here's the work I want you to do, and the web workers send back, here's the work I have done. Uh, can I send this queue? Uh, no, I do the queuing myself. That's a well, good question, though. It might, they might queue automatically, and so... so they would go to the event loop. Yeah. Whatever, right? e each web worker has its own event loop, just like JavaScript itself has, an event, has its own event loop. So, so yeah, yeah, that might work. Yeah, but it, but it doesn't have window or document, uh, except for something new that you told me about. But you can just assume that like it can't draw to the screen or anything. It could just compute stuff. Yeah. And so in the spec, it says yeah. this is like an OS level thing. So like it's an actor model where you send messages back and forth. Mm -hmm. But if you want to spin up a new one, it's like you know, make sure you have the memory for it. Make sure you have enough time to actually allocate this much memory. So right. it's not when you first hear. 
these are going to be great. Yeah. <laughs> Tim? So, well, here when I look at clock full P fib and then a dotted line, uh -huh. I see a straight line here. Does this, uh, and these arrows, each one of these arrows is going to be message passing to a web worker delegating a task? Yeah. Or, and in the future, you're going to be able to combine those three tasks into one, so there's only going to be one message passing sequence that's built? So, it's, that's actually an interesting question, right? So, what's better? If we have three expensive computations that are composed signal wise, would it be better to have messages and have all three running at the same time? So, may, so it, and, and it depends, it's different for every workload. For some workload, yes, the message passing is a, is a resource overhead or performance overhead. So we would rather send one message and, and execute all three functions on it and return. But sometimes it might be better for us to have you know, one message and then a second message and a third message, three different tasks, and one of them makes it all the way through and runs on the first web worker and then the other one you know, like, why do you have a, a washer and a dryer, uh, right? I, I'm, just, I'm just really scared because I've traveled from Haskell and the Banes and the weird comment style GHC, GHC compiler pragmas, mm -hmm. and I think that's the wrong way to go with, with this kind of telling them what to do in a case-specific scenario. So I think we should actually think about that a little bit. So we were talking yesterday about ways to uh, do, like, branch prediction um, and see, like, if right. this particular thing takes a long time. Like I, so we could yeah, yeah, we could observe at runtime. Oh, this yeah. function takes a long time, yeah, so we should run it. Opinion, yeah, we should have actually a two-step compiler mm -hmm. that would first compile with profiling turned on, and a second-step compiler that would take a profiling profile and then compile with the knowledge brought in by the profiler profile. Right, sort of like how a database uses table statistics to figure out how to run its query. You could yeah. similarly say, oh, well, these functions are expensive, these functions are cheap. So which ones should we compose? Which ones should we expand and run on multiple web workers? And yeah, that, that, that I think is a really interesting uh, improvement on this. Obviously, that's a while down the road, but it would be really cool. And, and I think the groundwork is, for, is there for something like that to exist. So basically, you're choosing between pipelining and not pipelines. Right. So if, if I have, like, um, you know, I could say lift f dot g dot h, right? Or would we rather have lift f dot lift g dot lift h, right? And so both of these would, you would expect to have the same results, but they might have different performance. If these are all tiny functions, then this might make sense. If these are all expensive functions, then maybe we might want to run three consecutive like input events um, so they could all be running at the same time. So it really depends on when is it worthwhile to exploit parallelism, so and when is it worthwhile, yeah. It's, it's, it's if you want, so the first one gets to do faster, lower latency. Yeah. Faster exactly, yeah, so this is the latency trade-off, this is the throughput trade-off. And, and yeah, and, and that's like, it would be cool for a compiler to help you as much, and I think at the end of the day, maybe it, yeah, tuning and profiling is always phase two stuff. So uh, it, maybe you want to write this out explicitly or, you know, how much of it is automatic. <laughs> yeah, right. So, so back when I said, uh, right, you can zoom in while you're doing a presentation, right? So pipeline parallelism. So we get that also. So we get pipeline and the independent execution. So it's kind of neat. Right. So for me, the roadmap for this project is to um, to rewrite it again because there are bugs. Uh, writing a scheduler in a kernel is, is really tough. Uh, I switched over to TypeScript in the middle of doing this, and that helped me a little bit. Right? Yeah. Um, I, I can also think of a couple like it's really messy code. So I would kernels need to be clean code. So I, I need to start this over and and try it a couple times, uh, see what happens. The next phase, uh, once that sort of finishes, I would try to write a, a little Haskell library that uh, compiled or generated the pure and set up code, right? Um, and so then possibly hooking up the Elm backend to output that side in, instead of the traditional runtime, um, I, I think would be the next step. So I think that's the route I'm gonna go. It's, it's significantly different 
than the current Elm runtime, so I don't know that a total replacement, uh, or a, you can't really hot swap it in. Hot swapping, yeah. <laughs> Next talk. But. Um, well, I can say the easiest thing is to use the events loop more often, right? But uh, the most challenging part is... To be able to create it for Elm, it's, it's just too different. It, I mean, the... the, the um, so pure code and setup code isn't necessarily separated. Um, also, this operates on each node as its own little... Uh, thing with a queue for, I mean, there, there is no uh, idea of uh, queues in, in uh, the sequential process because everything just happens once. We don't have to keep track of messages. So, we, so for me, I need to keep all these queues around for each node so I don't drop any messages. For the other one, we just use the, the global events loop and, and everything you know, falls through in one round. So, so the architecture is just significantly different. Right. So from my perspective, I think the key thing that I'd be looking for when thinking about incorporating something like this would be some sort of uh, performance analysis of saying, OK, here are the particular cases when uh, we're going to be faster or we're going to be slower, and is this going to be worthwhile right. uh, from that perspective? So like if we have all of these Elm programs, and they're all going to take a three times performance hit for uh, the keyword, then that's going to be so I think that's going to be where the trickiness is going to come in. Because mm -hmm. it's like, how can we ideally send things to workers when it's, when it's necessary? Right. And, and, so this, and this may not be the best strategy for using workers. The best strategy for workers in Elm may happen to be that, you know, we're running, we're running. Oh, it turns out this function is really expensive, so we're just going to set up a worker on the side to do this. That, I think, is also a good approach to using it. Um, so... Yeah, yeah, just, just sort of a proof of concept. Of mm -hmm. are, They're really tough are, yeah. <laughs> and unfortunate that we don't have something nicer. But you know, at the end of the day, they do get the job done. Uh, you know, yeah, so. incredibly. Right? Yeah, I was I was pleasantly surprised with some of the things that came out of this. So, yeah. Okay, well, I think that's it. So, thank you guys.